Hey everybody, it's Master Gallengeist here, bringing you my review for the latest episode of Secret Invasion, Harvest. And I actually really enjoyed this episode. We got consequences for the fallout of what had happened in the previous episode, and we didn't get any kind of cop-out or kind of death fake-out. Uh, Talos is dead. And, and granted, however much that means, at least in this one, it's sticking long enough that even though people do get resurrected in comic books and everything, uh, we'll have to see what kind of goes on. But for this, for the purposes of the story, he's, he's dead. So we start off the episode, we see that Fury is talking to President Ritson. Now granted, he's evidently a lot more injured than we thought he was. Like, he didn't look horrendously bad, but granted, there's probably internal kind of stuff and everything. Fury's trying to tell him that uh, it wasn't the Russians, uh, don't trust Rhodes, and the thing is, they're trying to ask him if he's got security clearance, and he kind of, they kind of wheel Ritson away, and then Fury pretty much pulls up a chair, takes out his gun, and sits in front of the operating room, and it's like, Jesus, uh, we're into the secret invasion. It's like, what if one of the doctors was a scroll, man? Sweet Jesus. So... We then see that Scrody, uh, who we do learn in this uh, episode, is Rava. So I'll refer to Scrody as Rava. Uh, pretty much gets in, uh, gets a call from Gravik, pretty much telling Rava to relay to Ritson that the Skrulls are working with the Russians and to even give them information on New Skrullos' site for an attack so that way Ritson could kick off World War III. And this also works into Gravik's kind of favor because when uh, Rava gets to the hospital and Fury confronts Rava, uh, pretty much leads them to the whole kind of bit of like getting Fury out into a more kind of compromised position because he likes the scrolls, he wants to help them as well. And this, he's, Gravik's pretty much utilizing his own people as hostages, even his own followers to get the harvest, which we learn about a little bit more in this episode. So, we see that confrontation that Fury's like, fuck you, man. Uh, I know you're a scroll. Screw you. And he's like, and Rob is like, listen, uh, pretty soon the shot of you uh, killing Hill is going to be going wide, so you better kind of deal with that first. And then, of course, we see the Secret Service is like, <laughs> Rob was like, you're never going to get within 100 feet of the president ever again. It's like, whatever. And Don Cheadle just does a really great job of being able to sell the difference between the roadie that we've known throughout the MCU and this asshole. This, this just brash, grating dick cheese of just fuckery that's like... Mm. You could just tell Fury's like, I want, uh, <laughs> if I ever get you into a position, man, where it's just you and me, you're done. So Fury then gets all get out, gets out, uh, gets out of there, and has to deal with pretty much being hunted. He links up with Gaia. Gaia's kind of pissed off. We get Fury kind of explaining why uh, he picked kind of London for the kind of scroll kind of bit, uh, giving history of World War II, of it being kind of like shelled out and other kind of uh, immigrants pretty much coming and mixing in in this kind of space. And Gaia being like, my father's dead. He failed. And he vehemently disagrees. He's like, no, the struggle is steep for finding a home, finding a place, doing this fight. And he died. Yes. But he did not fail. And I liked that kind of thing between them as they're trying to figure out what to do next. Of course, Guy is like, he's trying to go after Harvest, whatever the hell that is. And Fury's like, God damn it. And she, of course, wants to bury her father. So he tells her to go sync up with Priscilla and to then deal with it that kind of way. And then she's like, where are you going? I'm going up to Finland. You all right? And she's like, yeah, I got some faith. Uh, I got... I can, like, get away with exchanging my face and everything. Which kind of opens up a thing of, like, why uh, Gaia and Priscilla don't just change off their faces. Like, narratively, it makes more sense and kind of feels like a plot hole. But the thing is, you get these actors to play these characters. So I understand why you're not just switching them out 
every so often uh, because like, oopsie daisy, I should be dead because I got executed by the uh, Skrull War General. But then you get Amelia Clark, and you're like, uh, I kind of want to use Amelia Clark. Like, granted, they could do certain kind of scenes where they like kind of going around and shift down to their default mode or whatnot. But I'm all right with it. So let's see. How do we want to go about this? Then we get actually some good kind of character moments um, with Sonya as well. Sonya? Yes. Uh, Sonya... Um, and Gaia, and Priscilla, and even Gravik. So, a big kind of thing is that Gravik's team at this point is really like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, uh, Pagan, uh, the one that's pretty much his right-hand man, uh, there's, he's like calling him in, pretty much like, listen, we're pretty much trying to force the World War Three scenario still. Uh, we kind of had to change it up. It didn't go exactly as plans, but we're working on it, which actually works out. I mean, Gravik has pretty much been thwarted on a lot of different kind of attempts, but not to a big enough of a degree to him to seem incompetent. Uh, though, granted, I do like that he's getting called us like, why is it, why is it Fury dead? Do you have a soft spot for him? I mean, shit, Priscilla failed at killing him, and she's still alive. And Gravik is just done taking these questions and then just fucking kills him with his group powers. It's like, damn. He's like, fucking do what I tell you to do. And he's trying, like, he called out his right-hand man for failing to get the harvest. Like, evidently, he was supposed to steal this thing. Now, we didn't know it at the time. I, I get it more together as we go throughout this episode. But the cracks are forming, and we see Beto being like, that ain't cool. Which then leads to the next uh, kind of big thing with Gravik, where uh, Beto is like, I'm scared and everything. He gets kind of a call, and then... He pretty much gets set upon by a mutiny slash coup thing as people are trying to take his ass out. And this is a really good fight scene because it shows how the others are trying to take him out and how, yes, he does have superpowers, but that doesn't mean he's invincible. Granted, uh, Extremis makes him pretty hard to kill with his healing factor, but they're trying to suffocate his ass. And then he just, like, goes scroll mode and just beats the shit out of him, utilizing his powers sparingly. Now, granted, I know that visual effects are a thing that you got to thread between carefully. You don't want to overuse them, you don't want to underutilize them. I think it works within this fact, uh, fact that they work well enough, they get him back into his scroll kind of form, he's utilizing his group powers, uh, he pretty much goes through and kills them, and they try and plead for the one dude, and he just kills him, he's like, brah! And he's kind of done with that kind of shit, like, god damn, so... Not all the scrolls are behind, and he's pretty much trying to utilize fear at this point. Whereas instead, he was using the honey words of, like, I'm doing what I'm doing. But then, I think he's kind of gotten into a point where he's essentially in a tailor's position. Where he's saying he's able to do something, but as the series is going on, it's harder to achieve those objectives. And seeing the people being like, we want results. Now, granted, it takes time to get certain kind of results. But when these people have been waiting 30 years and you're telling them we can get you this plan and even sooner and that's not happening, we see the clashing of everything. This makes sense and it's like, it's cool, it's cool to see it play out kind of like this. While this goes on, we see that Sonya has decided to take matters into her own hands, investigates pretty much this, I believe it's like ahead of a... Uh, um, like her boss as a scroll, and she's like, ah, fuck this shit. Shoots his ass. We see the blood, and seeing him shifting, it's like everybody walks, like comes in, like, what the fuck are you doing? She's like, oh no, I got this shit. Like the actress who does her is fucking phenomenal, and she's a great character to watch. I don't like her character because she just does. She goes nutty, hambo, doo da, and then she's pretty much pumping information for the Daltons because she understands the Super Scroll program and where it's kind of leading because we understand what the harvest is when we learn about it. She then goes to the Daltons, pretty much uh, gets their information, gets on the uh, wife of the pair. Let me see. Rosa Dalton. Yeah. And tries to figure out what's kind of going on. She's like, we can do this the 
nice way or the not so nice way. And then pretty much the one dude's like, yeah, I'm going to shoot you with my shotgun. It's like, this isn't how this works. And then her, like, uh, thug dude comes in with a silenced pistol. They, like, go through this stuff. They start burning it out. They're taking their stuff away. And they're pretty much complying. But then the husband of the pair holds his wife pretty much hostage and be like, I'm not going to let her fucking uh, tank this shit. She's like, God damn it. You're just like the males of our species and everything like that. And then just fucking shoots his ass. It's like, God damn. Because we hadn't seen her get her hands vastly dirty. Yes, she cut someone's thumb off, but that was in a position where she pretty much had control over what was going on. Here, it was a little bit uh, looser and that it's like, okay, let's see kind of how she deals with it. She just pops out a gun and shoots him point blank in the head. I'm like, yeah, she's not one to really fuck with. And it's just showing that like we've got vastly more morally gray kind of people just like roaming around and we're going to have to kind of deal with that with other things kind of going on in the MCU. Uh, thunderbolts. So, that gets linked up there. We get that Rava Scrody is detailing for the president, who pretty much just eats it up of like, that the Russians are working with the Skrulls, here's the site, we gotta attack them, which is like, that would initiate World War Three. It's like, the uh, war's better than extinction. It's like, um... Yeah, but the thing is, World War Three could possibly lead to our extinction. It's like, okay, like, what the fuck? And of course, he does. He conveniently doesn't talk about Taylor's saving his ass, but of course, we do also see that there are newscasts going on talking about how the president was saved by an alien. So it's like, there's a lot of different kind of things at play. But it's like Ritson, thank. But granted, he is discombobulated and is being told information by someone he should trust. It's like, ah, uh, shit. Alright. Uh, and then Fury's pretty much on his way to Finland. And Grabba pretty much calls him being like, listen, the strike's going to happen. Uh, unless you give me the harvest. It's like, alright, we'll kind of see how this kind of goes off. Fury then pretty much gets on this plane and links up with actually a character that we had seen from the Black Widow movie, giving him pretty much passports and stuff like that and telling him not to be grumpy, and then pretty much to fly into Finland. Um, we then see that Priscilla uh, links, uh, not Priscilla, uh, Gaia and Priscilla link up, Gaia with her father's body, um, and then they pretty much talk about kind of what's kind of going on, why she's still here, why did they pick this place, uh, Fury picking it for lots of privacy, security, and Priscilla's, uh, no, Priscilla, a guy is like leather, and Priscilla's like, no, sunlight, so you can read, and she just, ex like, the way she's able to talk about Fury just sitting by a windowsill reading, and how the sunlight hits his skin and everything like that, you really get sold that she loves Fury, and Gaia then hits back, hey, does he love you when you're in your own skin, and she's like, that's rude, and that's mainly because you're young, with less experience. And it's interesting, she's like, and the thing is, if they're coming for me, I want them to come at the place where I've been happiest, and where her happiness is. And then, of course, we see that Gravix uh, soldiers pop in and try and take them out. And then we see that Priscilla, of course, being the wife of Nick Fury, has uh, backpacks and, like, armor and weaponry, and seeing her and Gaia tag team fight this strike team is awesome because we see the skills of each one. Uh, Priscilla is no slouch. She's been a covert operative for over 30 years and she just kicks ass. So does Gaia as well. But seeing them kind of play off each other and not be used to kind of the tactical kind of situations of like working together work pretty well as they kind of work around. And the action scenes are pretty clear. Little bit jump cutty on certain kind of things, but not as much as it could have been. It's like, all oh, right, and we see that they've got all this stuff on, and they also move to do the burial for Talos, and Priscilla kind of helps out by doing the prayer because Gaia doesn't know it, and uh, offers her father to travel well into the beyond. And it was nicely done. I liked seeing them both kind of work throughout this and give us an understanding of scroll burial rites as they do a funeral pyre for Talos and burn his body. It's like, that was a good send-off for him, 
while also giving us nice kind of character development and insight into Priscilla and Fury's relationship, and the kind of relationship between Guy and Priscilla as well. So, I liked that. That worked very well for me. So, then we get to, let's see here... that uh, Fury gets into Finland. He utilizes the veal that we had seen in Winter Soldier to uh, change his face. He gets and links up with Fallsworth, uh, Sonia, and he's like, yeah, I know that you invested a lot of tech. This is the old school stuff. And then she turns on the radio and raps kind of blurred. He's like, are we doing this? And she's like, yeah, like the happiest kind of like, I give no fucks, I give no shits. I'm the one in charge of this kind of shit. And they kind of get uh, into Finland, like, uh, 294 uh, kilometers from the Russian border or whatnot, and they go up to this graveyard, and we see the Furies got graves everywhere, because this one has a different quote than the one in Winter Soldier. The one in Winter Soldier has the beginning of, like, the Pulp Fiction one. Uh, I like that one, but I like seeing a different kind of quote here, and she's like, why the hell are we here? And she's like, well, he's like, well, this is where I honeymoon with Priscilla, and that the scrolls like the cold. And just that little uh, drop, and Fallsworth like, ooh. And he doesn't need to, he says it without completely saying that, yo, my wife's a scroll. He's like, oh, okay. And it's kind of cool thinking of Fury and Priscilla kind of honeymooning. And she's just trying to get information on what, and it's like, okay what the hell is going on here? What's this harvest thing and everything? And it's like, well, after the Battle of Earth in Endgame, heroes blood a lot. So he tasked Gravik and the rest to collect all of the DNA that was in the battle, even blood uh, drawn from Carol Danvers. So it's the harvest of all the prime superhero Avengers DNA. And it's like, oh shit. And she even asked, and then why haven't you called the Avengers for this? And he's like, listen, this is my kind of thing. I've been in this world longer. I want to deal with this my way. Now, granted, an invasion of like a million scrolls trying to shapeshift and take over Earth is something you do call the Avengers for, in my opinion. But I do understand that Fury wants to deal with this his way since it's, in his mind, his kind of problem. So it's a delicate kind of balancing act of, you really should call the Avengers for this, but the Avengers are pretty much broken up at this point, and we're kind of waiting for the new inciting New York incident or Battle of Earth endgame level event to reunite and bring together a new team of Avengers. And Fury was like, listen, I've only been given what's in my head uh, that was given to me also by my single mother, and I've got to do this myself. Because that, he wants to prove that he's nothing, that he's more than dust. Showing how the blip has really affected him because he's, he's thinking of that and it's like, I couldn't do shit on that. Which, incidentally enough, is kind of a thing that I've been seeing in One Piece. So, there's some nice kind of parallels of like, there are things that we can do and things that we can't do. But, we should focus on what we can do. And Fury, this is kind of his thing. As he utilizes his wedding ring to open up the gravestone, get the harvest, and then go in and get himself decked out in his Fury regalia. His leather jacket, his eye patch, his cap, his guns. He's ready to fight Gravik. He's ready to go and end this. So I think this is a nice kind of setup to the last episode, the finale. We'll see how that kind of works out. This one was like 39 minutes or whatnot in length. I don't think it overstayed its welcome. I don't think it was too short either. It worked within the time frame of what was shown and to get us set up for the end game of like Fury having to take on Gravik and how he's going to do that. We don't know that exactly. We know that Gaia and Priscilla and Fallsworth can be allies for this, but that's kind of a smaller kind of pool at this point. We'll have to see who else he's able to call in, what's going to kind of happen, what Fury's plan is for this. So I would preferably have liked to have an idea outline of his plan, but we've got Super Spy Fury back. He's got his shit back, and I think it was an effective build-up of seeing him go through everything throughout these episodes, lining him up from where he's been post-blip, and then getting him back to the Fury kind of endgame kind of goal of he's the super spy. This is his shit. 
this is what he does. So let's see kind of how he kind of works with this. So he's on the back foot. Uh, Interpol's kind of going for his ass. He doesn't really have the resources or the allies that he should at this point, but that doesn't mean he is any less dangerous. He has dealt with vast crazy shit over the years that has escalated to having to fight a fucking purple alien with a gauntlet that can change the fabric of fucking reality. Yeah, but this subterfuge, uh, espionage, uh, giant world-ending stakes, that's his bread and butter. That's his shit. So I'm interested to see where this goes, and I can't wait to see what happens next. So those are my opinions on the episode. Tell me what you guys think in the comments below. If you liked it, if you didn't like it, if you agree with me, if you disagree with me. Also, like and subscribe, and I hope you have a good day.